Professor Melly Mail, the Hood Post man. You know that vibe. Look, we'll be back here today for part two. Introduce yourself, sir. Brian D for Core Report. Man, um, you got more names than that. Bones Low, Bright Dog, Low G Bright Dog, and that's the extent of it, man. I, 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 I ask you that because I'm sure that based on the geographical location, the name changes. Would that be an accurate statement? That would be accurate. I'm known as Bones in the Antelope Valley. I'm known as Bones all over the Bureau. To my intimates in the Federal Bureau of Prison, I'm known as Pride D or Pride Dog, just to my intimates, because I feel that, you know, you have to have the right to call me Pride Dog. And that means we have to have history. There you go. So let's get into it, man. We, you know, because Professor Billy Mellon, we've got to dive right into this stuff, man, because this stuff is very important. And I think it's like, it, it helps to um, lighten the load on yourself. And I think a lot of people don't understand this is really therapeutic, man, when you get down to the brass tacks of it. You know what I mean? For a lot of guys such as yourself, you serve how many years? 18 years straight. 18. Now you get to come home, sit in this nice living room setting, and you get to just sit here with Professor Melly Mel and just, man, tell your story. <laughs> so let's get into it. Okay. What do gangs function off of? Let's get that, let's get that out the way. What if if you had to put a uh a definition to it. What do they function off of? Would it be accurate to say notoriety or do you have other ideas about that? The duality I say would be notoriety with economics. Mm -hmm. Because the vast majority of gangs in the inner city and economically strapped neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So notoriety in order to profit economically speaking, because if you're a notorious gang or you're a gang for known as for such a violent nature, other gangs won't infringe on your territory. And if they don't infringe on your territory because of the fear factor, then economically you can do because it's a criminal structure if you're gonna be realistic. So mm -hmm. economics. So if you had to put a perspective on it, where do Bri D, Bri Dog, where do you fit in the grand scheme of everything you just said? Well, it's like I said before, everything I am makes me everything I'm not, and everything I'm not makes me everything I am. I will never denounce my neighborhood or say that I'm a former gang member. I'm a non-active gang member because I don't subscribe to the mentality of a gangbanger. So in the scheme of things, I try to encourage young dudes not only from Carver Park, but from both sides, Keyways and Don Moves, that, man, there's no successful gangbanger. Find something else. I, I I totally agree because I talk with a couple of people. Uh, Tesla and uh, Figueroa, I don't know if you know who she is, but she has a podcast on uh, well, Charlemagne and God is on, on Soapbox Network. But anyway, she said this, G-Code, yesterday is not our future. You know what I mean? In other words, as G's or BG's or whatever, whatever title that you... Uh, extend to yourself, we got to be on code as black men. And and I think we're we're struggling to find out what is that code, you know, I mean, what can we use as a, um, a measuring stick for a code of contact for Domino's Keyways and even SH? Well, for a code of conduct for me, it's like when I tell brothers don't call me the N-word and they say it's ingrained in them. I say to the Crips, you, don't, you think before you talk to a blood so you don't cuss him. And I say, Bloods, you think before you talk to a crip, you don't blood him. So therefore, a code of conduct would be, think before you talk to another brother. Mm -hmm. See, because universally, we give the nod. So back to that code of conduct. Well, you know, it's like I said, you could have the loneliest bum in America, and former President Obama could walk by, him, and a brother going to go like this to him, he's going to nod. If it's just a one-on-one. -on -one. Is that universal? That's universal. So therefore, that's already the foundation for a code of conduct because we acknowledge each other. So that's an ethnic identity between black folks. Is that what you're that's saying? That's what I'm saying. To a man, it's to nod up. Brother, I know what you've been going through for 500 years. To a sister, we always nod down because we want you to know our heart is your heart too. <laughs> Brothers don't realize that. You never see a man go like that to a man. He always go like that. And to sisters, he go like that. Think 
about it. So it's already instinctively ingrained in us, the nod. The nod up and say, what's up? You what's up, up, brother? Yeah, for 500 years we've been So why do we go down for the sisters? Because their heart belongs to us and our heart belongs to them. Hmm. Never look at it in those terms. Do Damu's keyways and essays, do they lack impulse control? Yes. Explain. When I was 16 years old, I would see the adversary or op, as the generation now says, and it would trigger an impulsive act, a spontaneous act. I would act impulsively without thinking. So yes, that even applies now. When you have reckless abandonment, it applies. We have so many case laws and cases where in public setting, brothers have upped that pistol and unfortunately killed an innocent bystander on an impulsive act. So yes, anyone that's affiliated is an impulsive individual. So after serving 18 years and you your feet is on the other side of the gate, you, you're actually standing on the free side of the, of the boundaries of of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. What was that feeling like? Well, when I initially came home, my homeboy LV, who just did 30 something odd years and is an entrepreneur, successful in his own right. I'm looking forward to meeting him too. You will, guarantee. He said to me, how do you feel? I didn't understand it. So I said, I feel great, man, I feel wonderful. He said, no, how do you feel? And so when he said I had to pause for a minute, and I felt out of my element when I thought about it. He taught me how to do self-checkout. He took me shopping, he took me to my mother's house. So I understood what he said, how do I feel? Yes, I felt elated, I felt happy to be home, but I felt out of my element and admit that to myself made me say, you gotta get on your game. And that's what I did because of the type of man that I am. Cool. I like to say at this moment, shout out to, rest in peace, matter of fact, Diamond Blue. And I want to shout out to Chico Moose, uh, Prue Dog, of course, Willie Herb, and, and, and rest in peace, Felton. And shout out to my boy, you know, Boss Hog, of course, and my boy, old man. I always got to shout those cats out, man, because those are my guys right there, you know. And, and I cannot say this, man, Bop and Bone. Man, they my guys right there, man. So yeah, I just had to get that out, man. Yeah, you know, Bill Hart's right my cousin. Yeah, <laughs> Bone held things together when they need to be held together. Willie Herbie and Moose are my G homeboys. See, people don't understand structure. The generation above me are the G homies. Yes, they're OGs, but their title are the G homies. My generation is the last of the OGs. Then the generation in front of me is OBGs, then BGs, then OTGs. And TGs and now an IGs. So it's structure. And Corbin Park has structure. So when I refer to Willie Irvin Moots and Felton, rest in peace, those are my AKA G the homies. Undertaker. The Undertaker. Those are my G homies. I don't call them OGs. I call them G homies because they're first generation. Let's let me add, tap into that, man. How did he get that name, Undertaker, man? That's the unique well, name. I mean, uh, I think it would be self-explanatory. Okay, we'll, we'll, leave it, we'll leave it right there, you know. You know but Willie Herb, yeah. you know, that's my G homie. That's they're brothers. They're brothers, and when you really think... Who was about, older, Felton or Willie Herb? I believe Felton is older. And when you say the face of Carver Park in that era, it's always mm -hmm. mentioned in the same way, however you want to mix the three up. Undertaker, Roy Tucker, Willie Hurd, Willie Hurd, Undertaker, Roy Tucker, or so forth, however you want to mix it up. Felton was more in tune with me, but Willie Hurd was like I said, you just did play with him. You know, and that's what it is. So I'm going to beat your ass, you know, homie. You know, but he did instruct us in it, and, and, and he's giving the brother, you know, history of the hood that I didn't have, but coming up. Well, let me say this Carver Park, 11 8. And success, right? Right. Is the oldest Crip hood in Compton. Now, I don't know if you knew that or not. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but it is the oldest. That's where everything, because everything came east. Right. And spread it out. Yeah. 
you know, so I just want you to know that, man. But talk to me about the Sherry Capri, man. Let's talk about that, man. Well, all right. Tookie called the Sherry Capri Solomon Gamora. Why is that? Because in that era, in 71, 72, 70, Woody Hurd, Felton, Zane, un, you know, Undertaker Felton, Roy Tucker, Glue Baby, Papa, they had pretty much control of the Sherry Capris. So you had an influx of females who were not promiscuous, but you know, you're coming out of the free love 60s and it's like, hey, whatever. Shout so, them homegirls out before yeah, you go any further. You know, I personally, well, I know Crip Connie used to come through. And Crip Connie. I, I, had a I just threw up a picture of her yesterday. Yes, call her sister Crip Connie. That was my baby, and she wouldn't give you the time of day, but she gave me the time of day. But she wouldn't give me the time of day out of the way She I was, was tough as nails. Yes, she was. The little as she was. With the 501s, boy. Woo! Man. But anyway, you know, so Tookie coined it Solomon Gomorrah because everything went. What I mean by that, you know, it was, they did what they did as far as, you know, adults. And with us, at that time, when Bartender got killed, Carter Park was catching hell. But Willie Hurd, Undertaker, Roy Tucker, Blue Baby, they made sure that nobody infringed upon our territory and there were no casualties on our end. So it was the Sheer Capris in my day, the Sheer Capris, because 118th didn't run through. It was a canal there that you had to walk through over the bridge. And the Sheer Capris was like where we went to hang out at. My generation, we would go hang out there occasionally, but it was more so Willie Herb's generation. Okay, glad you explained that. So now let's get back to the freedom tree, man, because I don't think you gave them enough information about that freedom tree. Okay. Well, the freedom tree consisted of this. When Willie Herb, these are the guys that coined that name to it. Willie Herb, Roy Tucker, Undertaker, and you notice I say Glue Baby and and Zane. And, and Zane and, and, and Santos and Papa Tex. They when they used to go do what they had to do in upholding the neighborhood, because it wasn't an influx of money, then it was a territorial thing. This is our neighborhood, so you're our rival. The Freedom Tree was where they went to make sure everybody made it back safely. 118th Street did not run all the way through. In between Central and, let's say, Success, or let's just say Robin Street or Palmer Leo, it didn't run through. It was a canal that you walked through. And so that way they made it safely to the freedom tree after whatever happened. And they knew everybody would make it safely to that freedom tree. And they could see all angles of everywhere. They could see back to the boys club. They could see up success. They could see up. There was only two ways in there. Success and I believe Parma Lee, if I'm correct. And those are the only two ways in. So from the freedom tree, you was at a strategic angle. And then only we knew how to get through the boys club, which they call the boys and girls club now to be politically correct, but it's the boys club to my generation. So that's where the freedom tree came from, to make sure everybody made it bring it back to the neighborhood. Uh -huh. So the freedom tree was a big deal for you guys. Yeah, the freedom tree was a big deal for us, it was an inherited generation. And then we coined another tree, the freedom tree, my generation. On, really? When you came off of Wilmington. Under whose authority? Under <laughs> Michael Westbrook. You know that's you. Uh, you know what you did. <laughs> no, but uh, like basically Michael Westbrook, it's my whole way Westbrook, myself and a few other guys. When you came off of Dee's Liquor, when you came off 123rd off of Wilmington, you would make a left and then you would make a quick right. And it was a safer part of our neighborhood because back then, like I said before, all sides are equal, but we caught hell on the park side, and a lot of dudes weren't centered on that side like that. Gotcha. So that freedom tree was where we can go kick back and it was never no drama. But the original freedom tree was an area like when me and Bunky, we used to go back there, and that's when I smoked PCP. We'd get wet back there, and we didn't have to worry about nobody coming. We were safe. We can see everything in the neighborhood from all angles, strategically speaking. Okay, good enough. Um, here's a deeper question. For the younger generation, are they fucked up on what they heard? Or, they, or do they know what they seen? Because 
I think that a lot of the stuff that they reacting to is the stuff they heard, not necessarily stuff they're seeing. So if you can explain that or just put it in context based on your opinion. Well, my opinion is from what they heard, but it's from what they heard from their peers. Because, okay, who can say this? Grannies, neighborhood block, the block, nutty. And then the guys that are younger generation don't even know why they beef with who they beef with. Who can say Carver Park this way, Motor Park this way, front of it this way, corner pocket that way, and don't know we used to put the arrows and all of us band together for the Watts Parade as well as for Centennial. Why they don't know them stories? Because they think they know it all. And what they lose sight of is when they had that fiasco going in Atlantic Drive, the OGs against the BGs. BGs you always lose because there are more of you than the OGs. So is the onus on us to, to make sure they, because this is what one of my purposes to to explain the history right versus uh, what they think it is. Well, you know? the thing is, your platform, and I'll give a shout out to the Brother Kev Mac platform. Absolutely. Shout out to Kev Mac Video with content is Kev. Yes, sir. You give a realistic view of not glorification, but like what the generation now don't realize is we set the precedent for everything that goes on with you. We set the precedent, unfortunately, for you to walk in prisons. We set the precedent for you to make however you make your money. We set the precedent on the culture period. And they don't seem to grasp that concept. So, but when you think about it, man, the streets is undefeated. All the tribes, is gone. every last one, I don't care which one you name, they all took L's. Yes. But the streets is undefeated. Right. And when I say it's undefeated because name me one person that's won and went on and became something bigger than what was it ever think of or even imaginable? So true. And, and it's a line in the Rick James song called Ghetto Life where he says, Brother, you don't have to hurry or you don't have to worry. The ghetto will be there tomorrow, so don't you hurry. Something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And it's all changes, but it all remains the same. Now, they don't get that of anyone that knows me know I'm a counter hopper. I robbed banks, I robbed credit unions, I robbed jewelry stores. The only successful is your last lick that you got away with. There are no successful bank robbers. There are no successful jackers. You're successful on that last lick and if you retire, I don't see anyone successful in the street life. No one. Okay. Even if you own a variety of things, you still are successful because they can knock at your door at any given moment. Perfect segue. Your four degrees, right? How has your four degrees set you up right now to see things in the terms of what you see them now versus you saw them 18 years ago? Well, economics, which is a business degree, it taught me about economics. Sure, I knew how to get money. Sure, I knew how to save money just to spend it. But now you structure, you orthodox, orthodox okay. so to speak. I want a pair of 501s, but I'd rather have on a pair of Walmart $14 George jeans. It doesn't matter. That's thirty some dollars I just saved. That's what Bill Gates wear. Okay. Uh, so economically speaking, I'm more not a miser but frugal with my money in a sound sense. Why is that important? It's important because I'm trying to accumulate generational wealth because I have grandchildren. That's why it's important. I don't matter. My children who have children don't matter. What matters is the generation after that. My children who I mean, my children who have children don't matter. But my children who don't have children matter because they can guide my children who have children. How long did it take for you to arrive at that understanding? Because that's where we all should be in our thinking. To be completely honest, roughly 10 years ago, I started changing my way of thinking. And that's what made me pursue the degrees. Now, when I, took, when I, when I pursued social, when I got my degree in social behavior science, it made me understand the ripple effect. Which is simply this, I always said to myself, whatever, whatever I did to another gang member, it was, he was banging, he had that coming. No matter okay. what it was and no matter how extreme it was. But by getting a degree in social and behavior science, I learned what the ripple effect is. 
What about his mother? What about his daughter? What about his sister? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even though they were civilians. So that's how I got to this point of where I'm at in consciousness about us as a people. So talk to me about the United States of America. United what States. has that done for you? The United States of America is something that I co-founded with uh, Heyru or Dwayne Hendricks. And we're, we're as geared towards is solutions because we all know the problems. Everywhere in the United States inner city, brothers and sisters know the problem. But we always talk about the problem, but we don't bring any viable solutions. So United States of America is because of the networking that I've done in federal prisons and outside of federal prison, we're just bringing a solution to the problems. You know, I mean, if you could take a brother off the streets and say, hey, man, you go to school for three months for coding, you can start off making 80000 a year. But if you miss two days, we pull you out of the program, but we'll pay your bills for three months. Uh -huh. That's better than him making 1000 or $2,000 a week on somebody's corner, taking a chance of getting his brains blown out or going to jail. Because now he has the old, not carried in front of the horse, per se, but he has a goal, an objective of $80,000 a year as a coder. So we're in the process of presenting solutions and financial assistance, but, which doesn't negate this, but it'll negate the assistance if you miss two days of school. Okay, look at it from this perspective. Should our target area, and I'm just, is this a thought of mine, should our target area be junior high and high schoolers? And let me explain why. It's because their minds have not quite made up. And a lot of the um, tribal recruitment starts at the junior high and high school. And by the time you go through those steps, you get to high school and you, whether you wind up with, with a diploma or, but you don't wind up with a set of skills that can go out into the world to where you can continue to grow and develop into a full grown man, right? Right. So what happens often is that once they come out, there's nothing there besides the neighborhood. So I think at this time, they embrace it even on a deeper level. So I'm saying to you, United Streets of America, should our target group be the young? Because if we cut those individuals out, then there's no recruitment. Then the old would do what it does. It fizzes out or it grows, it matures. But as long as you got fresh bodies, the young to come into those tribes, and we don't cut that off, it'll be a continuance. What's your thoughts? Now, I wholeheartedly agree. Yet in the same token, I feel that it's okay. If there was a program like USA, United Streets of America, and a guy came home from a fresh 18 and had nothing to go to, and he's tired of prison, he's tired of living the way he's living, and the opportunity presents itself, and he's intelligent enough to find a different field that he can go into that's suitable to him, and he doesn't have to worry about his bills, then it applies to him too. Yet, I agree wholeheartedly, start off at a younger before they can get enraptured in that lifestyle, but still keep the availability for that guy, not only the guy that's coming home, but that guy that's coming out of a rehab, that that guy that's on hard times, Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because if you really take the format of the Nation of Islam in the latter part of the 50s and the 60s, they took every drug addict, every ex-con, and every brother that was down on his luck and taught him economics, self-empowerment, and got him a job, even though it was within the nation. And you cannot include not include the prostitutes and, and, and the pimps so and, yes. and it's, it's both other sides, people. Both, yes, right. yes, 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 yes. So I wholeheartedly agree what target area should be 6th through 10th grade as a starting point. Yet do not close the door on others who are simply like, Absolutely. like myself. Absolutely. I was tired of living the way I was living. But Absolutely. because I have the discipline, the motivation, and the determination Absolutely. within, I was able to accomplish what I accomplished. But what about the brother who doesn't have that and needs a crutch? A crutch not for eternity, but a crutch just to get ahead. So what I want to do right here. It's because I want to part four, I want to part five, I want to part six from Bright All. So I don't want Bright All to go too far. Okay. So at this moment, what I would like to say, it, is all, it all begins in, in your mind. And what you give power to has power over you. And if you 
allow it. So therefore, you're one of those individuals that hasn't that's shown that you're not gonna let nothing overpower you because you, you're showing your growth and your development since I'm being home. You have made some really good strides. And later on, I'll drop a link to I get a view of not where you, but I get to put a view in the link so they can get an idea of what I'm saying. But without further ado, Professor Melly Mel, the hood postman, and who I'm with today? With OG Brown, Carla Park. Man, you got four different names. You keep you doing that. Slow, and you with Brian D. Okay, and we're out. We out. Now we gotta bring it. <laughs>